So here we are. Go deep. <clears throat> We're going to entitle this series, uh, this this. Uh, lesson um, that we're going to study in Revelation, the Great Treasure Hunt. And as we go through this, you're going to understand why it's called the Great Treasure Hunt, because there's truly so much treasure in the book of Revelation. And But we're not going to stay in the book of Revelation. There are a lot of other scriptures out there that uh, deal with uh, Revelation, and, and we, we're going to have to just put the pieces of the puzzle together. And so this is session one, and, and what we're going to do in session one is an introduction, but this is kind of going to be our theme for this entire, this group, is go deep. And this is, to me, the best scripture. Now, I'm sure there's other scriptures that are equally good in addressing this, but to me, this is what go deep means. Solid food is for the mature, but for those who, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. And... Going deep into God's Word means taking it seriously. Okay, It means taking your commitment seriously, and it means digesting solid food. And one of the problems we have in ch modern church today, uh, in this country, it's, it's really not a huge problem in other countries, especially persecuted countries, because they have to go deep. You know, Rudy and I were talking about this last night. You know, what is one of the reasons for this? And I think it's that the, the devil has just done a really good job of distracting us, filling our lives with stuff. And, and making us focus on the temporary instead of the eternal. Um, and that's just the way our society has evolved. And because of that, most people are still nursing on a bottle. They are still, they still have a baby bottle, even though they may have been Christians for 50 years. They still have a baby bottle. They're yet to go into the solid food, the meat of the word. Uh, and notice that solid food is for those who have their power of discernment trained by constant practice. Constant practice. It doesn't mean practice on Sunday morning. It's constant. Mm -hmm. To distinguish good from evil. Okay? When, when you have reached this level of maturity, you can walk into situations and you know if there's good or evil or if it's neutral, if it's just flesh. Okay? And that is kind of my goal for every one of you. Some of you are already there. And some of you are going are gonna to get there. So, what is this class? What, it's not, not a class. Go deep. We're not going to. We're going to call it a class just because uh, that's habit. But we're, I don't want us to look at it as a class. We're going to be a small group of believers that seek to fulfill the functions of the church within our small group. As First Baptist Rose Sharon has a mandate from God to fulfill the functions of the church that we find in Acts chapter 2. We also, as small groups, our Sunday school classes, have these same mandates. So what are we going to do? Evangelism. All right? That's why I have one of these in every class. We have to remember that our goal is to fill that seat. That's what we're shooting for. It, if, if we're not here to fill this seat, and if you can't see it, it says, I am lost. Okay? I am lost. I'm eternally separated from God. What will you do? Notice the use in all caps. What are you going to do to help me find you? Okay? If, if that is not the first and foremost in your mind, and I don't mean just for this, this group, that's got to be the first and foremost in your mind when you walk out of here all week. Because if that's not the first and foremost in your mind, one or two things has to happen. It either needs to become the fir first and foremost in your mind. And that takes time. I'm not going to say it's going to happen overnight. It won't. It took me years. Or you need to reevaluate where you are in the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Because God's heart is after the lost. You know, the very last <clears throat> words of Christ, and, and I, I have a sermon that I preach on this about, you know, the importance of last words. And if any of you have ever lost a parent or a sibling or a child and you knew it was coming, when you were talking to that terminally ill person, you didn't fill it up with small talk. The last words I had on this earth with my dad were the most important words that I could possibly muster. They were the, my heart and they were his heart. Okay, You don't goof around and go, how's the weather? When you think this may be the last time you share something with somebody, or somebody's moving away, and you're never going to see them again. You don't small talk. 
you get to the heart of the matter. The very last words of Jesus were make disciples. That's his heart. Okay, and that needs to be our heart. So, prayer. That's another function of, of the church. And of our, we're going we're gonna to model that. Worship, what we just did. Okay? Fellowship. And by the way, fellowship, guys, is, is not just let's get together and eat. And, okay, I realize that we're Baptists and we do, you know. And every denomination, for those of you who are Methodists who are going to be watching this, you know who I'm talking about? Every, every denomination thinks they eat better than every other, everybody else. It doesn't matter whether you're Lutherans or Methodists or Presbyterians. We all think we ought to eat the others. Fellowship is more than that, though. Fellowship is what we do when food's not on the table. Fellowship is bearing one another's burdens. Fellowship is grabbing some guy by the hand, some, you know, some brother, some sister, and agonizing in prayer with them. I mean, when we do that, we for, we're fulfilling, you know, three of those things. We're, we're, we're praying with them, we're worshiping the Lord through prayer, and we're fellowshipping. We're bond Because all fellowship is is bonding our hearts, okay? And that takes all sorts of different forms. Discipleship. Kind of what we're, this is what we're doing right now. We're just, we're, we're, it's discipleship. We're, we're learning, okay? And as I go through this, I'm learning too. I'm learning with you. And ministry. And that's one of the things we will talk about in our works portion. It's you know, and it's not going to be a constant, you know, every week we're going to be, but we want to learn how to fulfill the Great Commission through ministry to others. And if that means once a month or once every other month that, a, you know, a few of us, not necessarily the whole class even, but a few of us say, okay, you know, we're going to go do this. We're going to go volunteer at the Pregnancy Help Center. And this is where I invite you, please, if you guys see a ministry opportunity or a ministry need, share it with us. Because I don't want, this is not my class, okay? This is our class, okay? Expectations. Yes, I have expectations. Um, I'm a firm believer in leading, that, that people follow a leader. And, and in this particular instance, I'm going to be your leader. But at the same time, like I said, it's not my class to run, okay? We are a family, all right? Mm -hmm. My expectations of you, what I want to see, and when I say expectations, this is not what I'm going to make you do. I'm not going to. But this is what I desire for you. This is my prayer for you, is I want you to go deep. I want you to go deep into God's Word. And if you're already going deep into God's Word, I praise the Lord for it. But if you're not, I want you to get into this. And this is going to take time. This is not something you're going to struggle. You're going to fall. And guess what? Nobody's going to condemn you for that here. And if they do, you let me know. Nobody's going to do that. Because we're a family. Okay? We're a family. And I want you to go deep into your prayer closet. I want you, again, to start sharing the burdens of your brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. Bottom line is you're going to get out of this class what you put into it. You're going to get out of this group what you put into it. And that, isn't that the, that's pretty much the way of life. You ran a marathon, right? You got out what you put into it, which I hope was a lot of, it was hard, wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, I've got that on my bucket list, to run a marathon someday, like Bob Lobo. <laughs> Curse you. <laughs> you know, I get out there and I'm like, oh, oh i got to lose about another 40 pounds before I can do this. But you get out what you put into it. To the best of your ability, I want you to be here on time or a little early, Okay. And like I said, you're going to get out of it what you put into it. Study your assignments. Herman, it's mostly reading. Okay. Yeah, I know he said, I'm not going to write. And I'm not, well, oh, I'm right, right now. Uh, most of what my assignments for you are just going to be, you're going to, I'm going to put the scriptures for the next week out there. And most of it, with the exception of this week, most of the time it's going to be a chapter. That what I want you to do is just look, read it and properly look at it. So that you're ready to receive what's said about it. And begin journaling. Okay? This is extremely important. I'm going to talk about it in a second. Uh, we're going to have group fellowships, and we'll talk a little bit about that at the end. We're going, to, we're going to get together as a group. Okay? One of the very first things I want us to do is on August, the week of August 28th sometime, is The War Room comes out. The movie The War Room. 
Uh, and I would like us to go eat dinner together and go see that movie because we need to honor producers and directors and actors who produce godly movies. Amen. And this is a godly film. Mm -hmm. This is all about the power of prayer. That's why it's called The War Room. It, it's not uh, Dr. Strangelove. You know, this is no, this is the, there's no fighting in The War Room. Everybody know, you know what I'm talking about? The, one of my favorite shows. Yeah. Gentlemen, this is The War Room. There's no fighting in The War Room. Well, The War Room this is talking about is the, the prayer closet. And it's got a, a powerful, if you've seen the trailer, and I'll, I'll try to bring the trailer next week. It's got a powerful section in there. Matter of fact, remind me, put it on, my, on the list to put the trailer, download the trailer. It's got a powerful segment of in there of an elderly black woman in a prayer closet holding her tattered Bible that you can tell has been read a million times, and she is calling down fire from heaven. It, it moves me. It's moving me now to have that kind of a prayer life. To know that when you go into that prayer closet and you go before the throne of grace boldly with boldness and incompetence and a cleansed life, to know that you can change things. Because I mean, we always talk about how important prayer is. But do we model that in our life? If we, you know, as I said, I shared it last Sunday. One of the things I love on Martha's email is if we knew, truly knew the power of prayer, we'd be afraid to get off our knees. So, I want you to tell, uh, help us by uh, leading in the areas of your giftedness. Uh, we did spiritual gifts tests, and I have them all if you did one. Uh, I sent them to Chuck a couple of times, and I don't know if he forwarded those out. If he didn't, I have yours. Okay. Okay. Send an email to me. And if you don't have an email, I can print you out one. You can hand, uh, I'll print you out one next week and bring it to Bring it to uh, bring a couple of copies, hard copies. Yes, I didn't get one. Okay, if you can send me an email, I have here it is. I have it electronically, and it's on an Excel spreadsheet. So if you have a computer with an Excel spreadsheet, you can take the test, save it, and you send it back to me. But the cool thing about the Excel spreadsheet is it automatically grades it, and I'm not going to go through the matrix of it and how I developed it and it's each argument each question is weighted differently and it's, it's, it's a you know it's like 70 questions but on the third sheet of the Excel spreadsheet you will see your spiritual gifts and it kind of explains how how it all works and and so my desire for us to all is to lead in our area of giftedness that's what the church is supposed to do that's what acts 411 is all about that's what us our job as leaders is to do is to train you in your area of giftedness Okay, to, uh, you got the gift of mercy and helps. Well, my job is to put you and plug you into those gifts of mercy and helps so that you, because I don't have those gifts. Okay, I'm not that guy. So if you're looking for mercy for me, I'll give you as much mercy as I can muster, but know that I don't have the spiritual gift of mercy. So if it's a self-inflicted wound, you're probably not going to get a lot of sympathy from me, especially if you've been walking with the Lord for any length of time. Rudy and I had this conversation last night. <laughs> If you're a baby Christian, a brand new Christian, well, I got all sorts of mercy and grace for you. But if you've been walking with the Lord for a decade, two decades, five decades, however long, and, and you're still, you know, pitching a fit like a little baby, and you know, when they're not getting their food on time or they've got a dirty diaper, you're not getting a lot of mercy from me. That's not, I'm not that guy. Now, fortunately for you, there are people in this class that have the gift of mercy that will love on you and and you know. And, and keep me away from you. <laughs> so, but we've all have, you know, God has gifted us uniquely. Some of us are teachers and preachers, and, and some of us are prayer warriors, and some of us have the gift of discernment, and, and, and some, you know, have the gift of administration. Some There's all sorts of spiritual gifts, and that's what we want to look at. And as I said earlier, let me know of any ideas for fellowship. I don't want to, I'm, I'm not running this show. This is y'all's class. So if you got an idea, or if you want to host, you say, you know what, I'd like we my wife and I have talked it over, guys. Talk it over with your wives first. Everybody understand that? That's just common sense. Talk it over your wife first. But if you want to host, say, hey, you know what? I thought about let's have, let's have a Sunday school party on Saturday, whatever. You know. Okay. Just give me some notice. And we'll work it in. All right. To the best of your ability. Lift this class up in prayer. Inform us of all your prayer requests. 
And if you miss a class and you have the uh, internet, my YouTube channel there, and I'll send this out in class notes if you can put that for like a class note. Uh, my, I will be posting the videos hopefully by the next day, but it may be as late as Tuesday or Wednesday, but should be the next day. And plus, if you wanted to go back and look at something, that's your opportunity. <coughs> and above all, never forget that we're evangelists. Go back to one. You, what are you posting on? That's what that is right there. The class. The class. When we, right here. Oh, okay. This kind of thing. Yeah. Now, we won't post the worship. I won't post the welcome. I won't post the, the, the prayer time. And I won't post the works section. But the class itself is going to be on YouTube. So if you guys miss, if, if you're out of town, and guess what? You know what? Everybody has to go out of town every once in a while, and everybody's sick once in a while. Really? You're not going to be behind. Sometimes football season. Wait, no, I'm, I'm just... so, <laughs> so the part here. that you are taping, if we say something stupid, <laughs> if you want me, if, if I tell you what, I'll, I'll make a deal with you. If you want me to edit out stupid okay. comments, okay. I can do that. <laughs> and I may do some self-editing as well. I didn't sign the waiver. You said my name. So never forget we're evangelists. Okay, here are our goals. Our goals, is, and then we're now we're going to get into it finally. Goals are to fulfill the Great Commission. Our goals are to grow individually, grow in love towards each other, to exercise our spiritual gifts. I want us to grow this group so we can become an assembly of small groups. Okay, that's the desired goal. That's your pastor's goal, okay, is that these small groups grow and that we function as a vibrant, what I call a micro church within the church. That's really what small groups are. That's what the early church was. You had a church and you had a church. You had a church and a house, and then you had the church as a collection of house churches. Okay? How to study. Well, you know, you can't really study well unless you have a relationship with the author of the book. Presuppositions. Everybody's got them. Everybody's got an observation bias, a normalcy bias. Set them aside. Okay? That, that will help you more in your Bible study than anything you can imagine. It's go in with a clean slate and let the Holy Spirit start writing on your board. Note-taking. Herman's doing a good job. Um, You're going too fast. I, I'm going to... I'm Like I said, this will be on YouTube. on YouTube. And if you want me to, I can send these class notes out. I can, I can, I can, I can make copies of the class notes. No mercy. Okay. <laughs> what? Yeah, you just said you had no mercy. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Okay, your secret journal. Here, here's what I, I think. Yeah, uh, your secret journal. This is going to be your study book. Okay, you're going to put whatever you want to in it. As the Lord deals with you, not just about this class, but in different areas of your life. I've got a journal. Okay, it's got a beautiful A and M emblem on it, Bobby. It's beautiful. Okay. Um, and I write all my thoughts and prayers in that. I, I write the deepest things that one day when I, when I go, when I die, my kids are going to open that thing and go, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but, hey, it's sealed until then. But one of the things I do with my journal is, is the Lord tells me things, or as I have questions about the Scripture, I write them in there. And then as the Lord answers those questions, I go back and I write the answer in there. Because here's what's going to happen. Every one of us is going to have ups and downs in our life. And one of the best things you can do is journal every day what God is revealing to you. And when you hit one of those low points and you think God ain't listening, guess what? All you got to do is turn back the page. And you can see where God answered that prayer. Or God taught you something. And know that God is there even during that time. Okay? So this is for you. If you don't want to do this, that's up to you. But I'm going to tell you right now, you will miss a blessing if you don't. Point blank. And guys, I realize this is really hard for us. Okay? It's very hard. But you're going to be the one missing the blessing if you're not doing this. And it may be difficult to start. Uh, and I used to journal all the time, and then I got away from it, and I rededicated my life to doing it this year, and it has been a tremendous blessing. So, helps. Um... Uh, I'm going to show you some helps. If you're serious about Bible study, and you should be, uh, and if you have a computer, you should have eSword. Everybody write that down. Or the, there's another one called the Word. But the reason why I use these two is because they're free. Okay, and I'm going to show you 
a little bit. And there's your journal. Uh, so for this class, I'd like you guys next week sometime to get a notebook, a three-ring binder or something. Uh, you know, something just like a spiral notebook that you can take notes in. You can jot questions down. Let's say you, you, you're kind of fuzzy about exactly what did Hebrews 5.14 say? The mature, the word is for the mature. You know, what is that? Well, I'm going to write that down. I'm going to go look at it. Okay, look at it later. Make daily entries about what God's doing. Okay, we talked about that. So eSword. Let me show you eSword. E this is free. And it's not coming up. That's just beautiful. Well, I'll tell you what. It's on the... Okay. So here's eSword. <coughs> okay, you go to eSword.net. There is no spyware in it. There is no add-ons that you don't have to click. You know, it's. Trust me, I've been using eSword for over a decade. Over a decade. And this is what eSword will look like. This is why I like it. These are all different versions of the Bible. You have your King James Version with the plus. Anytime you see a plus, that means it's got the Greek. And it's got the Strong's numbers. And all you got to do is when you click on there and you got the Strong's numbers, you click on that and you open up one of these down here, uh, usually uh, Thayer or Strong for the Greek. And if you're in the Old Testament, Testament, it's Brown's Driver and Briggs, the BDB right here. And you just click on that word and it gives you the Greek. Okay? Here's your commentaries. So wherever scripture I'm on, all of a sudden, all of these are linked to that scripture. This is the Treasury of Scripture Knowledge, TSK. So, let's see, uh, a servant. If I want to research what a servant is, there's all these scriptures that are pertinent to what that means. And the cool thing about eSword is I can just hold my mouse over it, and it's, that scripture pops up. I don't have to go to it. I just hold my mouse over Romans 11.13, and 11.13 will pop up. And then if I want to go immediately to Acts 9.15... I just move my cursor over, and it pops up. Super easy. Takes a very small amount of time to work with it to get an idea of what, what's going on. Okay. So, And when you get it, there's a download section up at the top. You just click Download, Bibles or whatever, and it'll come up with this. And all you got to do is you click one of these, and it'll come down here, and then you'll do Download Start. And everything that's free, you'll see. Some of it costs... But you don't have to download. I don't have any of those that cost. There's enough. Everything that you saw is all free. Because it's uh, open source stuff. It's stuff that's been around a while. All right. So here we go. Eschatology. What is it? It means to study the last things. Okay. And we're going to have to go through this quick. So this is where you're going to need to. You don't have to take notes right now. Uh, I will provide these notes for you. All right. Uh, this is a study of last things. Now, one way to look at prophecy is, like I said, it's a puzzle. It really is. Uh, you have pieces of the prophetic puzzle throughout Scripture, and it really is like puzzle, jigsaw puzzle pieces scattered on a table. Because sometimes this piece goes with this piece, and guess what? They're not in the same book. They, you know, just like what we read out of Psalm 91. That's a, that's a prayer for protection. But we see the Messiah's in there. Mm -hmm. And we only see a couple of verses about Jesus. And they're, they're, it's sunk in between other verses. True. So that's the importance of studying Bible prophecy as a whole. That's why we just can't look at the book of Revelation. Okay? Presuppositions. We have to remember that this book that we have is intricately engineered. And everything that's in it is there for a reason. Mm -hmm. Every little word. If there's a name there, it's there for a reason. God did not waste time. God did not just put filler information in so he could have a thicker book. You know, those of you who do a lot of reading, you especially novels, you'll see some paragraphs or some pages in there that like, is that really appropriate to the story? I mean, why is that? Or you'll see things on film, you know. Well, it's making the film longer. Because if we just got to the heart of the matter, the film would be 20 minutes. Okay? But God doesn't work that way. Everything is there for a reason. 
And as I will tell you now, and I will always tell you, the things that you come upon that look odd, out of place, I don't know why God put that there, start digging there. That's where your treasure is going to be found. Mm -hmm. Start digging. Well, why did God feel the need to put that in there? That doesn't seem real appropriate to the story. It doesn't seem like it addresses, trust me, it does in a mighty way, and you just don't know. That's where you start digging. So the best way to study is this is where eSword's going to help you, is to know the original meanings of the Greek and Hebrew. Fortunately, we live in an age where you don't have to know the Greek language to know the Greek language. There's plenty of stuff out there. Uh, know the context. If at all possible, you really want to know what a, what a scripture means. If, if I really want to know what something, what 1 Corinthians 5 means, I can read it in English and get a good idea of what it means, okay? But if I really want to get the heart of it, I have to put myself in the mindset of what was going on in Corinth. At the time, Paul wrote it. That's right. And then i got to hear it as if I'm hearing the Greek language. Because remember, the Greek language is not a made-up language for the Bible. It's what they used during the day. And so if I say diakonos, if I say deacon, we can't just think of what it means to us, okay, through the context, the lens of our tradition. We have in Baptist especially is an idea of what deacon is. But see, it didn't mean that at that time. If I said the word deacon or diakonos, and I'm walking around... First century Athens, they're honestly, they're going to think of somebody who's a waiter. Right. What we would see equivalent of a waiter of a restaurant. Or somebody who is in a household of an important person, and they're the servant. Absolutely. It doesn't mean slave. Okay, that's doulos. But diakonos means, you know, if I said, uh, go, get, go fetch my diakonos, then that means that I'm, you know, asking for my servant to come. Now my servant could say, I quit, I don't want to serve you, and leave. He's not a slave. He's a free servant. But yeah, he's getting paid to do a job. Okay? So, why study? Why do we study prophecy in general? Well, first of all, it's unfulfilled prophecy is 25% of the Bible. It's a one quarter of this Bible is stuff that is still future. Now, if we really want to be honest and true about the Word of God, and really want to be faithful to it, we got to study all of it. We can't just study the part that makes sense to us. We can't, we can't skip numbers. Okay? We got to go through, we got to do the, hard, the heavy lifting, the hard work, because believe it or not, I've been really blessed by the book of Numbers. Once I finally set aside these presuppositions that, wow, this is just boring numbers. And by the way, the book of Numbers is called In the Wilderness. We, we Anglos have assigned it the, the title, Numbers. The Jews didn't know it as Numbers. They talked about it in the wilderness, and it really meant, well, we don't know what's going on. It's our blessed hope, Titus 2.13. Eschatology, end times, that's our hope. So when we see the world going crazy around us, that's our hope. And, and like I said, these will be on your notes. I will, I will put these, figure out how to put these in a notes form. I'll print them out and I'll have Martha run some copies. Uh, because this teaches us how to live. You know, we're supposed to live expecting the Lord's return. Uh, 2 Peter 3, 7, 3, 11, you know, it talks about, hey, all, knowing that all these things are going to be blown up, basically. What kind of person should we be? Hebrews 10, 25, that's the fellowshipping verse. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. But what that also says there, all the more as you see the day approaching. In other words, as stuff starts to unravel around you and all hell is breaking loose on earth, you really got to keep fellowship together. Okay? So why study Revelation? Blessed. Look at that. You know, you get a blessing from reading the, God, the Word of God. But the book of Revelation is the only book that specifically promises a blessing. There is no other book in the Bible that says, if you read me, you're going to get blessed. It's assumed you will be blessed, and you will be. But Revelation is the only one that has the audacity to say, I am special, and I will promise you a blessing. But it's so funny because Revelation is usually the one book people don't want to read. <clears throat> and I don't know about you guys, but if God says, I, if you read me, I'll bless you, I want blessings. I don't know about you guys. I want blessings in my life. And so I'm going to obey the voice of the Lord. So what are some problems? Well, people don't read it because it's confusing. It's scary. It's a puzzle that cannot be solved. 
It is a 10,000 piece jigsaw puzzle of a haystack. Okay? There's a needle on one of the on one of the jigsaw pieces, but everything else is just a giant haystack. And I am not going to put the time or the effort to put that jigsaw of a haystack together because I don't know where a cloud is and I don't know where this is and that is. No, I ain't doing it. So they don't want to solve the puzzle. But the reason why they don't understand the puzzle is because the book of Revelation, and, and it's not really that big, okay? In the grand scheme of things, it'll take you an hour, an hour and a half to read through. There are 800 allusions in that 22 chapters. 800 allusions to the Old Testament. So the reason why people don't understand Revelation, and I've heard many preachers go, oh, we're not going to go there because that's just it goes because you don't know your Old Testament. If you know the Old Testament, Revelation becomes a lot more clear. That's what we're going to look at. So what's ahead? So what's ahead here is we're going to talk about the church and the world before the rapture. We're going to talk about what we call building events. Now, what is a building event? Think of... The book of Revelation, everything that occurs after chapter 4. So, you know, we have chapters. <laughs> have chapter 1, 2, and 3. These are the letters of the churches. This is a general introduction. And everything after chapter 4 is future events. Okay? Well, and it culminates in chapter 19 with the return of Christ. And we will have better ones by the end of next time. Well, this doesn't just happen in a vacuum. This doesn't just all of a sudden happen. Okay? This doesn't all of a sudden just happen. If you go on a trip, you've got a destination, am I right? You've got GPS on your car. You say, uh, you know, when we went to Portland, Oregon two years ago, I had Portland, Oregon in the GPS, and it gave me a route. Well, guess what? There's a lot of towns I had to go through. There's a lot of traffic jams, a lot of road construction, a lot of car accidents, and that long two-day trip to Portland, Oregon. That's the way prophecy is. We don't just get there without traffic, accidents, road construction. These are building events. You, you think the mark of the beast or one world currency or famine, the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, you think all that just happens all of a sudden? No. There's a foundation that has to be laid, and guess what? That foundation is being laid right now, and that's what we're going to talk a lot about. We, we can't get to that without taking a journey, and we're going to be here for part of that journey. And so that's really important is looking at these building events as we go through time because it lets us know how exactly where we are in this, you know. How many of you 30, 40 years ago could have ever thought of a one-world currency? Okay, you read about it in the Bible, but uh, now, with every country in massive debt, what would be the easiest solution? Reset it. You owe us $10 billion, we owe you $10 trillion, we, you know, let's just call a do-over. Right. And guess what? That's not just Nelson thinking. That's bankers. That's right. the, 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 the International Monetary Fund. That's these world bankers have talked about that. Am I am I Okay, that's their plan. Little do they know that it's part of our journey. They just think they're they're doing something special. That they're gonna. It's called the uh, uh, GCR, the Global Currency Reset. And there is talk that some of these guys it has leaked out. They want to do it this fall. Now I don't think that's going to happen. I'm not so sure it's going to happen. But I know you've heard that. That China. China. Yeah. And, and they yeah. So, that's part of our journey, building events. And we're going to study the letters to the churches, the seven churches of the book of Revelation. We're going to study these letters and see what it means to us as a church. We're going to talk about the role of Islam. Okay, I, I spoke about that a couple of Sunday nights ago, but we're going to talk more in detail. We're going to talk about Psalm 83, Gog and Magog. I believe these are some of those building events. All right? That's Ezekiel 38 and 39, is Gog and Magog. And you know what's funny? Is part of that section there actually includes Ezekiel 37. And that's the rebuilding of the nation of Israel. Okay? And you see that. And once we get there, that'll be part of your reading assignment. Is Ezekiel 37, 38, and 39. And you will look at Ezekiel 37 and know that God is talking about Israel. And you will know that you have seen that in your lifetime. You have seen the bones come together and the tissue form on it. 
But guess what? The part that we haven't seen, now, all that first part has been fulfilled, but the part that we haven't seen is God has not breathed a spirit into them yet. That's still yet to come. But when you think about fulfilled prophecy, know that Ezekiel 37 was fulfilled in every one of our lifetimes. It happened. And some of you who are a little bit older, who, uh, is anybody born before 48? I don't mean to call you out. 48? Okay. That's when the nation of Israel became a nation. But in 67, when they took Jerusalem, that's when all these things really started. And we're going to look at the book of Daniel. And we're going to talk about the rapture of the church. And we're going to talk about the mark of the beast. And this is just some of the stuff. So, we got a couple of minutes. Any questions? Any Anything? Before we get into our works, what's coming up. My goal is, like I said, we had a lot of introduction stuff to, be, to begin with. We won't go near this fast. Okay? <laughs> we will not go near this fast. I just knew I had a lot to get out this first week because I don't want to drag the introduction part and the expectations into two weeks. So know that we're going to slow down next week. All right. So any th any ideas, any questions? Look forward to it. All right. Well, so this week's assignment. Like I said, this is going to be the this is going to test your metal. Okay? <laughs> and it really shouldn't, okay? Read it in one sitting if possible. I say it's possible. Now, if you want to break it down into sections then 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 go for it. By all means, break it down in sections. But the best way to read any book of the Bible if possible. Now, if you get if you're talking if you're tackling Isaiah or Jeremiah, that you got to you better have a free day. Okay? Or the book of Psalms, let's not get carried away, right? But something like Revelation or if you're reading an epistle, let's say you're reading Ephesians. Let's say you're reading Galatians or, or Philippians or, or something like that. You know, you got to remember that this is a letter. Now, it's a love letter. God's love letter to you. Now, when I was at Camp Blanding, Florida, when we were newly engaged, or even, yeah, we weren't even engaged yet, were we? No. I was still wooing her. <laughs> she, we, we would, she would mail me letters. And, you know, after being in the field all day and, and dealing with a bunch of, of my fellow beloved Army guys, um, I would look forward to those letters. And guess what? I wouldn't read them a paragraph at a time. I didn't read them a page at a time. I mean, one time you sent me like a 15-page letter or something like that. I read that thing in one sitting. And I would imagine if you'll go back in your life, you can remember a time when you would get letters when you were away from your wife, your, your mom, your dad, whoever, and you would sit down and get, that was just the only thing in your world. Well, they gotta, you got to approach this like that. The book of Revelation will only take you about an hour, an hour and a half to get through. If you take it slow, it'll take you an hour and a half. If you, if you take it a little faster, it'll take you about an hour. It won't take you that long. Okay? So, But if you want to split it up, that's up to you. I'm just saying you're going to get the most blessing if you read it as a whole. Get a journal, begin journaling, however you want to do that. If you want a spiral notebook, if you want to get a bound journal, if you, you know, whatever, that's up to you. And then download eSort. Okay? Download eSort. Now, I need to, before we... Before we leave, I need to make sure everybody has filled out your contact sheets and your prayer requests. So leave, we're going to have a box. My box lady here is going to, we're going to create a box. You know, we'll put up box here lady. and you can put your prayer requests in that. Trust me, and we will get them out to you. But for now, just uh, hand them to us. So for next week, this is what we're going to look at. We'll, we'll talk about this at the end of every class, what, what's coming up. We're going to look at the different ways of interpreting prophecy. Believe it or not, not everybody interprets prophecy like Baptists do. A lot of people believe that the book of Revelation was fulfilled in 70 AD, which is a huge problem because the book of Revelation wasn't written until 90, 92 AD. So what they believe is history, or they think Revelation was written earlier, which makes John a liar because he said these are the things that shall come to pass. So what they do is when they say... It was written at that time. They call him John a liar. We're going to talk about the three divisions, specifically the things you have seen, and that's chapter one. So, when you read Revelation, go back and read Revelation one again, and it's it's only you know fifteen twenty verses. And we're going to get into a little bit more detailed introduction. We're going to talk about no one knows the day or the hour, and we might get to the role of Israel in Daniel chapter nine, uh, twelve, the unsealing of prophecy. 
Okay? And I know everybody's heard Matthew 24, 36. No one knows the day or the hour. Well, let me tell you. What did I, what, do you remember one of the things I told you you had to do? Is drop your presuppositions. Because we're going to look at what does that really mean. Okay? It doesn't mean what, what you think it means. All right? So event calendar. Uh, just, just one little thing to note. The 9th of Av is next week. We're going to look at, you know, this is a, by, does everybody know that this is an Oriental book? This is a Jewish book? This is not an American British book. It was written by the Orientals, which, you know, you consider Southwest Asia, or they're part of Asia, they're Oriental. This is an Oriental book. And understanding, a lot of what's written in is understanding the Oriental mindset. Okay? So... As we get closer to some of these feasts that are coming up, especially in September, we're going to talk a little bit about them. It's important. But next week, next Sunday, is the 9th of Av. And some of you have uh, probably heard of the 9th of Av. But it's an extremely important fast day in the nation of Israel. And we're going to celebrate the fast day with donuts and because <laughs> we're not under the law, we're under grace. So, but the 9th of Av, here are some of the things. Yes, sir. I have filled out some of our government papers 44, 45 years ago, you know, in the, in the service. Uh, 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 the Jew uh, was put under Oriental. Right. Because they are a part of, you know, we just have to look at this. Because when we think of Oriental, we think of Asians. We think of Chinese, Filipino, Japanese. Yeah. But it's not. It includes... Includes the Jewish people, the Semitic peoples. So on the ninth of Av, this is some just some of the things that happened on the ninth of Av. The ten, 10 of the twelve spies returned on the ninth of Av and said, "We can't go there." The destruction of the first and second temples in, in 586 BC and 70 AD were destroyed on the ninth of Av. The Romans captured Batyr, and the city of Jerusalem was destroyed in 136 AD. Expulsion of the Jewish people in England in 1290 and from Spain in 1492. Happened on the 9th of Av. And the Warsaw Ghetto. Everybody familiar with that? World War II. When they started deporting Jews from the Warsaw Ghetto, it was on the 9th of Av. This is, a, if, if, if Israel is going to have something bad happen to them, this is the day to look for something bad to happen to them. Okay? So it's the 9th of Av. And let's see here. Future. Talked about the war room. So begin looking at your calendars. And normally we'll have a little bit more time for works. Uh, and we'll talk more about that next week. Like I said, this we had I knew it was going to be hard to get through everything today, but I wanted, had a lot of housekeeping stuff. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then let's go worship the Lord. All right? Father, we just give you praise for who you are. We give you thanks. Father, as we get deeper into your word and as we study Revelation chapter 1 next week, Father, I pray you will reveal to us what you want us to know. Show us your ways, Lord, and... And, Father, put the heart of evangelists in every, each and every one of us. Mm -hmm. Father, help us to know our spiritual giftedness. Father, teach us what you would have us to, yeah. to do with those gifts that you, in, through, through your incredible love for us, mm -hmm. have bestowed upon us, Father. And we will give you praise and glory. In Christ's name, amen. All right, guys. Amen. Amen.